Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. We are in our family blueprints and you know, we're really on an important subject today on training and disciplining in the home. And uh, so last week we talked about godly parenting and how we lead the way as godly people. And this week I wanna talk about some nitty gritty things in the home. Children, you need to hear me out today. We're talking about obeying and honoring our parents today. And uh, we're gonna learn how we as parents are involved in that as well. So if you would, um, please turn in your Bibles to Ephesians 6. We're gonna be one through four, Ephesians chapter six, one through four. And, um, and I'm also gonna be reading Colossians 3, 20 through 21. That will be on the screen for you. This is what it says. And I wanna take some time to break down a, a few observations of this scripture, some lessons from it, and then round it out with the, the hopeful result that we have with applying this scripture in our homes. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. This is referring to a Christian home. Paul is talking to the church, so we're talking to Christians, and because you belong to the Lord, obey your parents. But this is also a universal natural law that children of all people, not even just Christians, when they are born, they are to obey their parents but especially children, because you are in a believer's home and you belong to the Lord, obey your parents, for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. The Old Testament uses the word honor. The New Testament will tend to use the word obey to mean the same thing. When you honor your parents, you obey them. When you obey them, you honor them. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you and you will have a long life on the earth. I'm not saying they're gonna do anything drastic to you. That's not what Paul is saying. But you know, you wanna be careful how you treat your parents because God is watching as well. Things will go well for you and you will have a long life on the earth. Now, fathers or parents, it says this, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Colossians 3, 20 through 21, Paul writes a letter to the church of Colossae, which was also used as a circular letter to go around to many different churches. And he gets to the point a little faster. He says, children, always obey your parents, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not aggravate your children or they will become discouraged. Let me focus on five things uh, here, first of all, that I see in this scripture that we can interpret here for us. And number one, parents are their primary source of discipline and instruction in the Lord. This task is not given to the government or the state. It's not. This task, amen. The state and the country, it's not their job to raise or discipline or instruct your kids in the Lord. It's also not the church's job. Amen. It's, not Pastor, it's not Pastor Brandon's job. It's not Pastor's jo Pastor John's job to do it all. It's not our Calvary Christian Academy teachers. All right, praise the Lord for them. It is the parent's job to raise our kids and discipline them in an instruction of the Lord. So let me speak real quick for, for teachers. Uh, we, teachers want parents to discipline their kids. Teachers want parents to correct their kids, okay? Now, teachers also understand this, because I've talked to many, a lot of homes don't have parents. And because of that, they've had to help. They've had to nurture. They've had to spend time with kids and care for them. And that's an issue. That's what we're trying to fix with this whole blueprint, uh, family blueprint series is we want to build healthy homes. So young people, 
you, we're, we're trying to help you get ready for marriage so that, that your family stays together and that you learn how to discipline your kids and raise them up in the Lord so that one day a teacher is really happy and gets an apples, you know, <laughs> bringing an apple. They still do that, I don't even think they do. So, and then it's important that of course the state and the government knows that it's not their job to raise our kids. So we need to do our part and they can do their part. So parents, let's make sure we understand here that we are the primary source of discipline and training in the home. But it goes on before, uh, beyond that. It says instruction in the Lord. You're not supposed to just raise good kids in the, in the world. You're supposed to raise godly kids. Okay, it's not enough to have a really good athlete, a really good musician, a really good academic student. Okay, you're supposed to raise a godly kid in this world because godliness lasts for eternity, not academia, not sports, nothing like that. Okay, number two, children need to be taught how to obey their parents. I wish kids came out going, yes, dad, yes, mommy, that would be nice. If we look at this, we're gonna think that, oh, children just know how to do this. No, they don't. That's why the word discipline actually means train in scripture. It's interchangeable many times. Train them or correct their ways of living. We have to train our children to actually learn how to obey. Uh, children need to learn how to control and subject their will to a command or request from a parent. This means we don't allow total freedom of speech and action in our home. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, you don't get to say that here, okay? All right, we put up boundaries. We formulate boundaries and lines of what is acceptable and unacceptable, and that is okay. Your kids need those. In these boundaries, our children use their free will to make good choices that are still honoring and obeying God and us as parents. Let me get to you, uh, let me get to this point of Andrew Murray in his book about raising children for Christ. It's a long paragraph, but let me read it to you because I find it profound and I'll explain some things as we go. This is what Andrew Murray says. The importance of this word obedience is more than the mind can grasp. God created man with his wonderful liberty of will that he might obey him. Obedience to God was to lead to the enjoyment of God. So rules and boundaries aren't to make you miserable, but to enjoy God. By disobedience, sin entered the world. So sin and disobedience uh, is, is why the world is the way it is. It's not doing well, okay? The twofold obedience of Christ and to Christ is why there's salvation. So because Jesus obeyed, Things have been repaired. Salvation has been offered. So now when we believe and obey God, we have salvation as well. So obedience is good, he's trying to say. The parent has the sacred charge of training the child to obey, linking happiness and love in home, in home life with obedience. The will of the child with his mind and affections is given into the parent's hands to mold and guide. In yielding his will to the will of the parent, the child acquires that mastery over his will, which leads to strength and safety, making him a fit instrument for doing God's will. Man was created free that he might obey. Obedience is the path to liberty. On this point, parents often err. They often say that to develop the will of the child, the will must be left free and the child left to decide for himself. Ooh, I don't know. They forget that the will of the child is not free. Let me remind you, we talked about this sinful nature in the second week of the series. Here's why. The sinful nature has wreaked havoc on us. We think we're free, but we're giving in to our sinful nature. We, we can become slaves to our sinful nature. So without the instruction of the Lord, your children are actually just gonna give in to their sinful nature. They're not free. That is key, isn't it? And let me keep going then, all right? They forget that the will of the child is not free. Passion and prejudice, selfishness and ignorance seek to influence the child in the wrong direction. The superior judgment of the parent, calmer deliberation and fuller experience of the parent are to decide for the child. 
But are we in danger of repressing the healthy development of a child's moral powers by demanding submission to our will? By no means. The true liberty of the will consists in our being master of it such that we become our own masters. Train a child to master his will in giving it up to his parents' request and he acquires the mastery to use it when he is free. Yielding to a parent's direction is the path to self-control and self-control alone is liberty. And in other words, what he's saying here is we must train our kids to master their free will, to learn to have self-control, to submit to authority so that when they get older and on their own, they're able to also live that way. Live in the freedom and the benefits of being someone who learned how to be obedient, not someone who learned how to rebel. So key. Number three, so number two, children need to be taught how to obey and honor their parents. Number three, we train our children to honor and obey God when we train them to honor and obey us. We want our kids to obey God. So when we take the time to teach them to follow us and follow commands, we're teaching them now to follow God's commands. This is what the scripture says here. Again, children are to obey their parents as if they were obeying the Lord. They should do this because it pleases the Lord, it's right. Uh, children to do this because it's a commandment from God. And they should honor you, even if they disagree, they should honor you because of your position as the parent. All right? Now, however, however, parents, if you are encouraging or condoning or teaching your children to do something ungodly, the kid has a right to disobey you. They have a right to not follow your directive, to not agree with you or affirm with you those actions. Well, why would you say that, Ryan? Well, let me, let me say this too. I mean, it's obvious why I would say it, but let me remind you that not all of our kids know scripture yet. So, you could be instructing them to do something or modeling something for them to do that is not biblical and they have no idea because they don't know the scripture yet. This is why kids are so vulnerable and impressionable and we as parents need to be really careful what we're exemplifying for our kids, what we're condoning, what we're excusing or what we're encouraging. Now, let me read to you what God gave me this week, but it's scripture and he led me to Matthew 18:6. But if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depth of the sea. Parents, let us be careful. I know this goes without saying, but let us be very careful that in our behavior or teaching or directives to our kids, we're not encouraging them to sin. We don't want to encourage our kids to lie by asking them to say something that's not true. Things like that. It would be bad for us to tempt children to sin, okay? Or make excuses for those things, all right? So we need to be real careful because it's better, it'd be better that you had a millstone tied around your neck. In other words, that you didn't exist because God is, would be very angry with us if we teach our kids to do something sinful. And it goes on to say that. It says, verse seven, what sorrow awaits the world because it tempts people to sin, there is great sorrow. It's God's wrath and judgment coming upon mankind because of it. So let us check ourselves. Are we training our children to honor and obey God by what we're training in our home? Let us be careful. And another point to this is children learn by our example. So do kids see you and me? Do, they, do my kids see me obeying God? Do your kids see you obeying God? And if they're reading the Bible and you don't realize it and they're going, man, my family is not living the way I'm, what I'm reading. I dealt with that in youth ministry. For 11 years, a, a, a student would say, what do I do when I'm living faithful to the word and my parents aren't? Oh boy, the children will lead us, won't they? Let it, parents, we need to lead the way, All right? So it's really important. Number four, we see here that we set our children up for a prosperous and long life. And I put in brackets eternal life because that's even longer than this life. But the promise is even on this earth, you will have a prosperous, well, long life. But who wants their kid to have eternal life? I know I do. Amen. 
Well, when we help our kids encounter Christ and help them understand Jesus and what he's done for them and lead them to a decision to follow him and obey him, they will have eternal life, praise God. But we can also make sure they're set up here on earth to have an, an amazing long life. Proper respect for parents in the home carries into all areas of life. Proper teaching of discipline and obedience carries into all areas of life. Think about this. If we are teaching our kids to be respectful and obey us, then they're more likely to respect and obey authority at school. Now, do we teach our kids to just give in to every command they get at school? No, because they may not be biblical, right? Oh, you can't have your Bible. Not true. Not true. You can have your Bible in school. That's an example of a, of a wrong directive from an adult. But should we respect and treat our authority in schools with respect? Yes. What about at work? What about at church? What about in the community? What about how we, how we view and respect our country? If our children can learn in the home how to respect us, surely they'll begin to respect the authority in the community. And let me tell you something, we are seeing a decay of respect for authority. We are, and it's not good. It's not good, but here's the thing, it starts in the home with our own example. It starts by our speech, by our behavior towards authority. You may not like people in the community, you may not like people in the country, but you need to be real careful what you're training and teaching your children in the home. Because scripture has plenty of things on that as well about respecting the authority of our land and being careful about that. So we need to consider that on the journey, okay? You don't want that to bleed into elders, family members, grandparents. You want, you want it to be good training and teaching of respecting authority, okay? When the, and this is, a, this is a quote from a uh, Ephesians commentary. F. Folks is his name. He says this, when the bonds of family life break up, when respect for parents fail, the community becomes decadent and will not live long. It's disturbing to see mobs of teenagers go into a store and destroy it. It's disturbing to see a mob of teenagers um, assault an elderly man on the street. My friends, we're seeing in front of us on TV the decay of society, but it's because of the decay of the family, and it's really because of the abandoning of God and his word. It all comes back to that. Now, there's a lot of good going on, too. We have a lot of good teenagers here. We have a lot of good young adults and young people who are doing great things. That just doesn't make the news, does it? It's sad. So there's a lot of hopeful things happening as well. Thank God for a kids' ministry. Thank God for a youth ministry here at the church, young adults. Uh, we, are, we are teaching and training them to, to obey God, to, your, to obey their parents, to honor authority and respect them. And you know, you know, we do our best, right? And they're also serving as well, which is amazing. So thank God for that. Number five, we can see one more important thing. There's many things I could take time on in the scripture, but lastly, I wanna focus on this. It's the part with the fathers and the parents. There's a right and wrong way to train and instruct our kids. This scripture shows us that. There's a right way and there's a wrong way. In fact, Paul shows a negative command and then a positive command here. Okay, let me just remind you what he says. He says, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. That's the negative. And then the positive is rather bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. So parents, you need to understand, and, and I need to understand this, that, that my earthly representation of God is on the line. How I treat my kids needs to represent who God is in scripture, okay? So God does a lot of things in scripture, by the way, and we could take an entire series on that. But does my behavior as a parent, is it, is it resembling God and the way he treated us? And there was some discipline and correction, 
and some pretty strong things God did, and there was a lot of mercy and compassion. Please do not focus on one or the other. There's both, okay? For some reason, some of us wanna just focus on all the harsh things, all the disciplinary correction things, uh, which is okay, because God loves those he disciplines, and he disciplines those he loves. But then the other side is we focus on all the compassion, and we never discipline our kids. Okay, God is both. God is both uh, truth and grace. And so we have to make sure we hold our kids to that. Um, it says fathers don't exasperate in one translation, don't aggravate, don't discourage. What would that be? Unreasonable demands on your kids. Petty rules or showing favoritism to another kid. Look how good he did. Look how good she did. You could do better. You could be like them. That would be an off way of doing it, okay? Um, what about this? Always noticing the wrong and never celebrating the right. You wanna discourage your kids real fast? Always correct them, but never praise them. We need to recognize when a child is wrong and correct, but we also need to recognize when they did right and celebrate it. You wanna discourage a kid real fast on, on a, the lack of obeying and not wanting to obey anymore? Constantly focus on all the wrong things they're doing. The first thing you say when you get home is, did you do your chores and clean up the house? No, 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 no. The first thing we should do is go, hey, it's good to see you again. I missed you today, I love you. How are you, how was your day? Now get to cleaning, let's go. No, sorry. <laughs> Just kidding, Just kid. Okay, you can discourage your quick kid fast if you're never seeing the good and, and saying, well done, well done. That's a great job, okay? Um, I, in my home, we don't believe that children should do something we haven't taught them to do first. Children shouldn't be expected to do something they haven't been shown how to do yet. You gotta remember, children don't know everything we know, okay? so. We're not gonna tell our five-year-old girl or five-year-old boy, go clean your room, and we never show them how to do it. But here's the thing. All those years of sitting in front of them, cleaning up all the toys and putting them back in the bins, we were showing them how to clean. But you still have to connect the dot. You still have to go hang out with them and go, this is how you clean your room. This is how you make your bed. This is how you brush your teeth. Okay, you never expect a kid to do something without first showing them the way forward. Okay, and then as well as we need to model and be an example of that too. Um, we should never be too harsh. We should never um, discipline out of harsh anger, okay? There's times where you're allowed to be upset as a parent because they are just rebelling. God got upset with his people too. But we need to be careful because we're not God, are we? So we need to be careful how we handle that. But we need to be strong and resolute with our response and not just give in to our kids' um, uh, rebellion as well, okay? So here's the positive command and, well, actually, hold on. God gave me something this morning and I wanna share it with you, all right? And then we'll get into the positive command. All right, follow me here. It's not your kid's fault if you're lacking patience. It's not your kid's fault if you're lacking gentleness. That first goes on us. What does the Bible say about the fruit of the Spirit? Okay, we need the fruit of the Spirit, which is gentleness, patience, kindness, all those things. Jesus says, abide in me and I will abide in you. That means remain, stay connected to me. If you're running out of patience, if your patience wick is really short, it may mean that you need to get with Jesus. <laughs> Okay, now, if you have a lot of patience and your kid is still testing that patience, then it's time to enact parental, right, uh, authority in that situation. But let it not be that because we're exhausted, because we haven't been with God, one little thing bothers us, amen? I might get emails on that one, I don't know, we'll see, yeah. <laughs> But that's what I've been learning too. A lot of times I've learned that my kids were actually helping me grow in patience. My kid was supposed to help me grow in being more gentle, being more kind, 
okay? Being faithful. Oh, you wanna play that game again? Okay, <laughs> it's the 10th time. I keep beating you, but let's do, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> the, when, you know, this, this is what happens. Kids actually help you grow the fruit of the Spirit, okay? But do not take out on them a lack of relationship with God in your life. Last week I said the three presents for our children, okay? Be present with God, present with your kids, and then present your faith. That's why I said that. Because if I'm tired and exhausted, it's not my kid's fault. If I'm not full of grace, it's not my kid's fault. That's on me. And I don't wanna exasperate or discourage or hurt my kids because I'm hurting in my relationship with God. I need to get it fixed. All right? Okay. Praise the Lord. Just teaching scripture. All right. The positive command? Rather, okay, rather than make them angry, which by the way, is, it's really hard to teach kids and instruct them and correct them in the ways of the Lord in righteous living if they already don't like you. <laughs> hey, come hang out with me, learn about Jesus. Uh, I'll pass because you just treated me so harshly and uh, un, you know, unreasonable demands. So we need to be really careful how we set this up. He says, rather bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. To bring up means to nourish tenderly or to give careful and loving care. I think that's interesting that this is referring to fathers because fathers, we struggle a little bit more on the tender love. Let's be real. Okay, we're not so tender. We're more, ah, suck it up. You'll be all right. Yeah. I mean, let let's, me just, who came to you when you were throwing up at night? Mom or dad? Or usually it's mom wins. Okay, moms win. My mom was the one that came to me. I don't know if my dad was trying to dodge the stomach bug because he can preach on Sunday. I don't know, but it was always my mom rubbing my back as I, you know, was sick. Because moms are really good at that. You're gifted that way. So fathers, and I, I get it, some fathers are gifted that way too. Praise the Lord. Fathers, bring them up in tender, careful, loving care in that way. All right, to discipline or train in the Greek means upbringing, upbringing through instruction and correction relating to character development. Okay, so to discipline or train is to help train up the character development. Instruction in the Lord, it means the path of righteousness. But they're really, they're really similar, aren't they? because we want to have the character of Christ. So the characters of Christ is the righteousness of Christ. And so we want to train our kids to live like Christ, to be righteous. So actually, 2 Timothy uh, 3, 16 and 17 actually refer to this. And let me see if I can get there quickly here. I think I lost my place. 2 Timothy, oh, here we go. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it, okay? God uses correction and training and instruction to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. How many want your kids to do every good work in the Lord? I know I do, all right? So parents, this is a reason why we need to know scripture because all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to train, discipline, correct, and instruct our kids to do what God has called us to do and to live in righteousness. What are some examples of righteousness? Blameless living. Honesty. Who wants honesty out of their kids? I know I do. So we're, we're correcting and saying, hey, was that a lie? because I see evidence that you spilled that all over the ground and you're the, you got red stuff all over your hands. <laughs> Caught red-handed. <laughs> right? We want to teach our kids to be faithful. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. You said yes, let's do it. Respectful. What about gossip or slander as they get older? Well, are you talking about your friends in the car right now? Let's not do that. They're not here to defend themselves. Slandering, okay? Do not cheat or steal. 
speak well of others? How about loving? How about peaceful kids? When you're around them, they, they keep the peace. They don't cause issues. Gentle, does not stand for sin or with sinners. Psalm one, Psalm chapter one, do not stand for sin. Do not stand in the way of sinners. Do not join in with mockers of God. Okay, what about merciful kids? What about generous kids, giving kids, patient kids? These are all the characteristics in the righteousness of God. And this is what we're trying to instruct our kids to do. And it's gonna take one simple word, consistency. Because that's literally what the word discipline implies. To be consistently doing the same thing, to do the right thing in the same direction, to train on a regular basis. Parents, we need to be consistent in developing these things. But you're not alone, praise God. Because when your kids are believers in the Lord, the Holy Spirit comes in and helps them do the same thing. You got a partner in parenting, praise Jesus, because you know we need it, amen? We need it. Man, thank God for the, for the Holy Spirit. All right, uh, let me get a, uh, we're about to land this plane, but let me get an important, important point across here. Um, to discipline and correct is to love. There is a really nasty lie out there that, that to discipline or correct someone is not love. That's not true. That's not scripture. We cannot, we cannot tolerate disobedience because you're gonna train your kids to rebel when they get older. All right? Um, let me tell you what's not love. Love is to not correct and not discipline. I mean, to, to not love is to not correct and not discipline. You wanna know what's not loving? is expecting people to forgive you as you keep sinning. That's not loving. Don't, don't say, you gotta love me, you gotta forgive me, but yet you keep doing the wrong thing. That's not repentance. Your kid needs to be trained to turn, to be disciplined, to correct their path so that they don't repeat the offense. Those scriptures are not an excuse to continue sinning. Those scriptures are at, at grace to help you not sin again. Okay, so our, our parents, we have to teach our kids to not be habitual sinners by correcting them. Now this is from scripture, Proverbs 3, 11 through 12. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof or correction for the Lord corrects him or reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Because of time, let me just tell you, Hebrews 12, five through nine, the Lord disciplines those he loves. And if he didn't discipline them, that means they're not one of his children. That's in Hebrews 12, five through nine, read it. That needs a sermon in itself for another day. But we are called to discipline and correct our kids because we love them. God does it to us. So why not do that for our children? Because we love them. We don't want them to go down the wrong path. We just don't. That's, correction has to do with getting back on the right path according to the word of God. Um, if, let's, let's, let's go through a little situation here, okay? If, if a child disobeys, okay, it should not be okay. It needs to be called out and corrected, all right? But here's what's really important, parents. A path of obedience also needs to be explained. Okay, we can't just say, you're not allowed to do that. That's wrong. Please don't do that, okay? Then what are they allowed to do? I dealt with this a lot in youth ministry. They were told, you can't do this, you can't do that. Okay, then what should they do instead of that? Okay, that is key, okay? Spell that out for them, and then they need to be held accountable to follow the path. So in other words, they said something wrong. What would be a better way of handling that situation? Okay, that way they learn what? Righteousness, instruction in the Lord. It's not about just not doing something wrong. It's about teaching them what the Lord would want them to do. That's what Paul's trying to say. Rather raise them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. So don't just tell them what's wrong. Tell them what is the right way forward, amen? Okay, now, 
we need to hold them accountable to that path. And if they don't follow through with that and they continue to do the same thing over and over again, there needs to be a consequence to that sin or to that offense. Giving in or giving whatever our children want because we are tired, exhausted, or I'm done with this today. I'm done, I'm just done. You guys, you just do whatever you want. That is not a healthy approach, but I get it, I've been there. I'm exhausted, I'm tired, I can't handle this right now. Um, no, we, we need to find strength in the Lord and do what we need to do, okay? To train and discipline and help raise our kids to do the right thing. And again, parents, we need to celebrate the good, okay? All right, what's the hopeful result? The hopeful result of all this is faithfulness to God. Yeah, faithfulness to God. What about a straight A student? That actually wasn't what God's focus was. What about a premier athlete? That is not, that is not what the focus of this scripture is. All of this will fade away. What about lots of money and wealth? That is not the focus. This is the highest duty of Christian parents. Parents should care more for the loyalty of their children to Christ than for anything. More for this than for their health, their intellectual vigor and brilliance, their material prosperity, their social position, their exemption from great sorrows and great misfortunes. The highest duty is to help your kids have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. The famous scripture, Proverbs 22.6 Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. I think we all know that that's actually been taken too far, hasn't it? There are examples, even in scripture, where the sons of Noah and Job, the sons and daughters did not stay with God. They were not faithful. They departed from it when they got older. It is the case sometimes. What's the point of this scripture though? If we help our children, if we lead them in the way they should go, okay, even when they are old, they're more likely to not depart from it because it's not always foolproof there, okay? And here's the other thing too. We need to, as parents, when you look at the scripture in the beginning, train up a child in the way he should go. Let me ask you a question, parents. Where are you going? Where am I going as a dad? Because where I'm going is what I'm training my kids. They're watching me. They're watching me. Where am I leading my kids? Grandparents, where are you leading the grandkids? There are some grandparents in here that if it wasn't for you, your grandkids wouldn't know Jesus, so thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> Praise God. Parents will not parent perfectly. Children will not obey and honor perfectly, but this is the hopeful result. You get your kids in front of God and they see God working in your life, we pray as we do our best, they will not depart from it when they get older. They'll come around and many have, praise God. All those prayers, all those examples, all the teaching, it paid off in the end. Uh, parents, when it comes to this, Again, your kids will copy you. Even as teenagers, they're gonna copy you right now. Let me tell you something that really helped my life. My mom and dad showed this to me. It's good to have both of them here today. Pastor's not at the other church helping out, so he's here. Um, be careful to make God and church important in your home, okay? Be careful how you speak or carry yourself getting ready on Sunday morning. All right, kids, get in the car. We have to go to church. <laughs> Sounds good, Dad. I can't wait. Here I come. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they're really lining up that fast to get in the van on that one. Be careful how you carry yourself when you bring in the church Wednesday or for events. Make Sunday a family day and even share it with friends from church grab some lunch or ice cream, hang out at our playground here for a little while before you go home. I see some of you do that, it's awesome. Have your kids bring their friends so it's, their friends are getting Jesus and getting in the presence of God and 
Hopefully they're being changed and transformed by the preaching of the word like today, okay? Make a day or evening out of, out of uh, going to church a joyful experience. And there's another important part. Carefully guard your attitude towards the church body and the leadership of the church. Be careful about what you're saying about people you sit around or people that go to church or the leadership of the church because your kids are listening and they're learning how to view church through your words and your temperament and your actions in the morning, all right? Be very careful. My parents were so careful with that because they didn't want me to have a distaste for church people or the church. Instead, they wanted me to go and have fun. They wanted me to have fun at church. They wanted me to encounter God and enjoy the day. And children, I just have one verse for you, all right? Proverbs 19, 20. Listen to advice and accept discipline, and at the end, you will be counted among the wise. You are wise. You are wise in God's eyes if you listen to advice, if you receive discipline and correction, if you accept it, you are actually wise. If you refuse it, That's not healthy, all right? If your parents are serving the Lord and they're trying to instruct you in the Lord, let them do it. Let them them share. Submit yourself to being taught by your parents. And here's the thing too. Parents, if we haven't gotten it right, apologize. We do that with our kids. Hey, you know what? We haven't been doing this right. Can you please forgive us? We're gonna gonna alter our our family leadership. We're gonna alter how we're handling you. Please forgive us. Give us another chance. We're gonna start over. My parents did that with me. My parents, they said, forgive us for not doing certain things at different times of the year or different times of our lives. They would, the Holy Spirit would lead them and convict them on things. And they'd say, sorry about that. And we're gonna do better. That's awesome. Parents lead the way on humility Be sensitive to that. And then kids, understand this. There's a lot of responsibility on your parents from God. Don't make it hard for them to lead you. Amen. Why don't we stand together? Wow, this is good. Praise the Lord for his word. Praise the Lord. It's interesting how much the Holy Spirit will write a sermon in the middle of a sermon too. So God gave me some things today as I preached the first service. I remembered to preach them today. Thank the Lord. I pray you have a great day with your family and your friends. And we have holidays coming up. We have the summer. We're in the summer now. And, uh, you know, there'll be some, uh, I'll be traveling, do, doing some, um, some ministry, doing some vacation time. So you're going to see some different speakers and missionaries. We're going to pray for our mission trip team next week. So be here ready to pray for them as well. And um, so... Just know Pastor Kuhn will be here to preach. Jody and others will be here to preach for us this summer. It's gonna be a great time together. Try to stay committed as much as you can, but enjoy your travels as well and be safe. Make sure we have quality, God-glorifying family time. Amen. This is why we've been doing this. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We needed this today, God, and we, we need to know that you love us. You love us in the correction and you love us in the celebration. Lord, we thank you for that. And Lord, we're not perfect, so we need to stay humble about being better at this as parents or as kids. Lord, I pray that we could have healthy conversations today and this week about this and help us to be committed to reading the word in our homes and sharing things that we got from it with each other. Lord, help us to practice that now, even if our kids are climbing all over the couches, let us read the word in front of them, let us pray with them. Lord, help us to set up a discipline path, Lord, to help them get closer to you. Lord, we're grateful for all the blessings. We're thankful for our kids. Help us to lead the way. Lord, we love you. We appreciate you being such an amazing father to us. Teach us, show us by your example how to parent. We love you, God. We give you all the glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen.